Is it just me or has everyone else been seeing a weird amount of subway ads on YouTube lately? Like seriously, I can't be alone in this, right? Well, maybe you're getting a subway ad on this very video too. And they're probably showing you warm toasted bread, deli meat all folded up like little ribbons and fresh veggies all crisp and green. You know, subway eat fresh, that whole saying, right? You choose your freshly baked bread, meats, cheese, and veggies to make a sub that's just right for you. Come in and create yours today. Subway, eat fresh. It just depends on what your definition of fresh actually is, I guess. If three week old lettuce, 10 to 15 day old produce and pre-processed chicken is fresh, then they are absolutely not stretching the truth at all. But if you'd like chemicals used in yoga mats and shoe soles out of your bread, then maybe you and Subway have a different definition. Yet Subway is still the largest chain in the US, not in revenue, but in number. They have over 20,000 locations in total. Financially, they don't seem to be well off. The $10 billion company is seeking a buyer and though they claim to be earning more money, price hikes and inflation likely boosted their numbers. Subway hasn't been discouraged though, and they've actually started to remodel themselves in the past year or so. The design is called a fresh forward design, which I find hilariously ironic and hypocritical considering that their food is virtually anything but that. Now, instead of the Subway you grew up with, the infamous sandwich shop looks almost like a green Froyo store with lemonade and limeade stations and quirky minimalist art. They're trying very, very hard to adapt. They've even added house-made pickles and gluten-free bread to the menu, but at the end of the day, they're still Subway. There will be 500 fewer Subway shops in the United States pretty soon. The sandwich chain is planning to close the location sometime this year. And who represented Subway restaurants for years, now charged with sex crimes. And some of the crimes were allegedly taking place at prestigious hotels right here in the city. Here's what we know. Today, Jared Fogel is expected to plead guilty. Prosecutors say there are at least 14 alleged victims. Fogel will serve jail time. And a new lawsuit claims there's no tuna in Subway's tuna sandwiches. The way they treat their customers and franchisees can't be covered with a bunch of green paint, unfortunately. So let's start to peel away those superficial layers and really take a look at what Subway stands for here on The Corporate Casket. And if you wanna find out even more information about some of your favorite episodes, up and coming episodes, ad-free episodes, and even bonus episodes that might be just a little too spicy for YouTube and Spotify, make sure to check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash Illuminati. I recently spoke about Bad Dragon, but I've got an episode coming up about the evil and dark legacy of Larry Nasser. It's way too dark for YouTube, but an important subject to discuss all the same. I highly recommend you take a look. And if that topic isn't for you, you can always make a suggestion in the Patreon private Discord server too. It's one of the most wholesome communities and it's a great time over there. So again, check it out. That's patreon.com slash Illuminati. Now a disclaimer, this section of today's episode will discuss SA and pedophilia. So please feel free to skip this section if you're not in the headspace to hear about it. We'll start with a chapter in Subway history that I'm sure the brand would like to forget, Jared Fogel. And here's the thing, I know you might roll your eyes and say Subway isn't responsible for the horrific things he did. It's not as if they could stop him and they have a right to assume innocence until proven guilty. Unfortunately, things are a little bit more complicated than just the black and white as most things are in life. In case you didn't know, based on the name Jared Fogel alone, this chapter is going to mention the sexualization of minors. Jared Fogel has become infamous for his crimes, but before he was known as a disgusting piece of scum, he was simply known as the Subway guy, the very face of the company. He was basically living proof that Subway was healthy because he lost weight eating one of their sandwiches a day for years. Try to imagine if Chipotle or even McDonald's was able to make those claims. A young obese college student trying to lose weight starts eating healthier and within their diet is one burrito or one burger every single day from one of those places. After losing about 245 pounds in less than a year, it would seem like this diet actually served them well. And for Jared, it landed him in a men's health article called Stupid Diets That Work. Once Subway saw it, the rest is history. Here is Jared Fogel. You may have seen him on the news or a talk show. He was inspired by Subway's great tasting sandwiches. Jared believes in an active lifestyle, including lots of walking. At the heart of Jared's routine are Subway sandwiches. Of course, the Subway diet isn't really the secret miracle diet that will make you lose weight. He had coffee for breakfast, a turkey sandwich for lunch, and a vegetable sandwich for dinner. 
As Jared was eating far fewer calories than he had previously been eating and adding exercise to his routine, of course he was going to lose weight. But this doesn't mean that Subway is the weight loss key that we've all been looking for. Even so, Jared became the Subway guy, seemingly adding credibility to Subway's claims that they're eating healthy and fresh. The two became intertwined and richer thanks to the other's efforts. And Jared even went around elementary schools with his old pair of 60 inch waist jeans, telling kids about how to eat healthy. As it turns out, schools were probably the last place he belonged. A former Subway franchisee, Cindy Mills, noticed some disturbing things about Jared early on. Right after they met in 2008, he told her that he liked them young and even admitted to her that he'd had sex with minors. As minors can't consent, I think we can just call this what it is, rape. Jared also said he had been with child prostitutes as young as nine in Thailand and attempted to convince Mills that she should get into the business herself and sell her body on Craigslist. So yeah, that took a dark turn a little too quick almost. One second, Jared was this all-American Subway eating average guy. And the next, he'd tell Subway workers about his sick perversions. But Mills wasn't alone. Rochelle Herman Walrand also spoke out, claiming that Jared told her in great detail what he did. Apparently, he had a charity devoted to children's health and conspired with the former executive director, Russell Taylor, to set up hidden cameras in his home. Taylor would retrieve the photos and videos of nude minors and then send them over to Jared, placing CP directly into his hands. And Rochelle was rightfully horrified. He would tell me the ages that he was interested in, boy or girl, and he would also indicate the fact that he has done it before. Herman Walren says she still worries about the victims. Those children suffer. Those children's lives have changed forever. Eventually, Rochelle ended up working with the FBI to take down Jared and hold him accountable. Jared fell from grace, Subway disavowed him, and now he's in prison, infamous and deservedly hated. But why should we be mad at Subway? Well, it's because they knew. Rochelle went to the authorities, but Cindy went to Subway. She spoke with the CEO of the Subway Franchisee Advertising Fund Trust, or SFAFT, which is Jared's employer. The CEO, Jeff Moody, cut her off and said that he dealt with those complaints before, but told Mills, quote, Don't worry, he has met someone. She's a teacher and he seems to love her very much and we think she will keep him grounded. And first of all, that is insanely messed up that Subway would put all the pressure on Katie to simply fix a pedophile by dating him. That's really not how it works. Jared won't stop exploiting children because of a new love interest. And expectedly, this she that Moody referenced, Katie McLaughlin, divorced Jared when she found out. She also claimed that Subway had been warned multiple times since 2004 and they failed every test of corporate responsibility. Secondly, Subway had the nerve to tell Business Insider that they had no record of the Mills allegations as Jeff Moody now works for Rita's Italian Ice. So either Jeff Moody didn't keep a record of this interaction or Subway is lying and they erased it or lost it, but neither is a good look. In my opinion, this doesn't really change things either. Subway may not be technically liable for this since Jared was an SFAFT employee, but I think the backlash they received is beyond warranted. This guy was going into schools, easily gaining access to children, even admired by some of them. And these horrific allegations were not taken seriously. He was the face of the company, their primary spokesperson, and he was a monster. And if that's who you wanted to represent Subway, like, okay, sure, go for it. But it just proved to me that you cared far more about money and appearance than the well-being of your customers and children if you had Jared representing you. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised though, considering the way they treat their employees too. Are franchisees frightened? People terrified. I feel threatened because I'm scared if they target us. Franchisees claim many want to get out, but say they can't because head office won't approve it unless expensive refurbishments are done. We want to escape, but they make it impossible for us to sell. The way Subway treats their franchisees has come to light in recent years, especially after John Oliver covered the topic in 2022. Not that much seems likely to change considering that this is simply the way their business works, but what's wrong with it? They give you an opportunity to run your own business and that should be fantastic news. But that phrase kind of also sounds like something a Hunbot would say. And while this is not a pyramid scheme, you could still end up pretty screwed if you buy into it. According to the New York Times, Subway grew so quickly in large part because of entrepreneurial immigrants. McDonald's might cost almost 50,000 for a franchise fee, but you also need to have half a million dollars in liquid assets and it can cost around one to $2 million to launch a brand new restaurant. Subway, on the other hand, is far easier with a much lower barrier to entry. It's only $15,000 for a franchise fee. And sure, while you have to hand over a fair amount of gross sales, which is 8%, 
and agree to other fees and stipulations that some chains don't, it seems like a dream come true for a lot of people. After all, there's no real cooking involved and you've got a well-known recognizable brand on your hands and you don't have to pay nearly as much money as other franchisees to do it. But if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Whereas investment firms buy up McDonald's and Burger Kings, families are the ones buying Subway shops. And many of them, around 30 to 50% are immigrant families too. And unfortunately, while that may look great on paper to offer individuals a chance to buy a franchise, many of these families and immigrants are unaware of the headaches that Subway can cause. They think it's a chance to build a new life, but Subway sees it differently. First and foremost, the fees are ridiculous. Maybe you've even seen TikTokers complain about the prices at Subway, but make no mistake, it's not like the franchisees are seeing as much of that money as you'd think. Subway charges 8% in royalty fees, but that's only if you agree to a whole host of other conditions like a non-disparagement clause, agreeing to pay three years worth of royalties and advertising payments if you close a store, allowing Subway to dictate your store's hours and plenty more. If you don't agree to those conditions, then you're paying them a 10% royalty rate instead, and that's double other comparable sub shop chains. And that doesn't even begin to cover the 4.5% advertising fee, which puts Subway's fees between 12.5% to 14.5%. And, and yes, you have to pay these fees even if you're not making a profit meaning that between employees' salaries and the bills to keep the lights on, you could very well end up paying more than you're making. And it's not like this is helped by the cheap cost of the $5 footlongs that Subway promotes either. When you're a thin margin for profit and Subway decides to make it thinner by pretty much taking all that's left, what's left for the franchisees? It's one thing for that to happen when you open your own restaurant, but there's something especially shitty about having to pay a company such a hefty portion of royalties, even if their brand isn't serving you whatsoever. Like their brand was damaged when Jared was exposed, right? Imagine being a Subway franchisee at that time, deeply hurt by the terrible decisions the company made, having no sense of recourse and still having to pay Subway a pretty penny for their advertising fees. I'd be pretty pissed too. So then how are there so many Subways open? They must be doing something right. And well, not really because more and more Subways are actually closing in recent years due to the basic flaws in their business model and their insatiable love of expanding. It used to be the joke on my side of the franchise industry that not only will Subway as a corporation take anyone with money, but they'll open a location three streets over. Franchise industry expert, Joel Livbata told Business Insider, they don't care. And Joel certainly was not wrong. In downtown Cleveland, Ohio, there are seven Subways in a one mile radius, seven. You'd think the company would tell their franchisees to spread out a little bit more so they're not competing with one another, but it's the exact opposite. One lawsuit claimed that Subway would encourage immigrant franchisees to open stores within blocks of one another, subtly threatening that if they didn't, the company would find someone else to compete with them. In other words, if you don't play this game, we'll make you. Though these revelations have been highlighted recently, they're not new by any means. Back in 1998, an economist at Fortune said that Subway was the biggest problem and franchising and a key example of quote, every abuse you can think of. And those are some pretty damning words and there's even more evidence to back it up. See, if business isn't going well, Subway isn't about to help you. They're not a caring corporation that wants to work with their franchisees and give them the tools they need to succeed, at least not as far as I can see. Instead, the corporate office can push store owners out of their investments, terminate the business and take control but surely you can't be kicked out for no good reason. No, 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 definitely not. So let's take a look at some of the reasons that you might be cited. A handprint on a glass door, the wrong brand of bathroom soap, cucumber slices that are too thick and needing a new bulb for a light fixture. And yes, perfect sets. Thickness of a cucumber, disgusting. That's definitely violation worthy. And a handprint on glass, no way. We want birds to be able to fly into those windows and doors if they so choose. And it's disgusting that franchisees would even allow a smudge on their restaurants. Now I'm being sarcastic here, of course, because this has to be some of the most ridiculous citation reasons I've ever heard. I get foods being improperly labeled and no sanitary hand washing station, but those are things you'd expect of any restaurant, but a brand of soap shouldn't be citation worthy. Still, this all really happened. And Mr. Tripathi said he experienced all of this to the point where he felt as if someone had a vendetta against his shop. Hell, when an inspector told him a light fixture needed a new bulb, he bought one immediately, but upon his return, he was cited anyway. But Rebecca Hustler, his inspector, really was out to get his shop. As Rebecca herself explains, she had instructions from her boss to find fault with the store and told the New York Times, quote, I was kind of his hitman. And who the hell wants to work for a company who's going to put like an economic hit on you like this? Rebecca even realized what she was doing was wrong, thinking we're ruining these people as she cited him for the light bulb. 
And while it's great that she has regret now, it's a little too late for Mr. Tripathi, who had his store stripped out from under him, his livelihood taken away, and his hope for a better future crushed. And seriously, I hope he's doing better now. I can't imagine how infuriating that must have been, let alone how paranoia inducing. Reviews do make sense when you're running a franchise, and I understand that Subway, or any shop for that matter, would want to make sense that a store is keeping the brand name squeaky clean. But if these inspectors are really consultants as Subway calls them, then they should do, you know, a little bit more to help the store do some actual consulting instead of just tearing them down. And even if you do have the right brand of soap, you can still get cited too, as inspectors have allegedly sabotaged franchisees by puncturing storage bags and then waiting to record the temperature. It's beyond disheartening, and so many of these store owners are unable to pay back their loans. There have even been instances of litigation in the works. One Nevada state court case claims that Subway's BDAs or business development agents exploit Indian Americans or Indian immigrants. Another in New York claims that franchise agreements were procured by fraud too. Unfortunately, the legal route is slow, so I'm not really sure when or if we'll see results from these cases. Right now, Subway has only given the classic dry corporate response stating, Subway is proud of its diverse franchisee network. Our current recruitment strategy focuses on attracting experienced franchise operators with strong business acumen and providing them with the tools and support needed to grow their business and ensure long-term success. Subway can refresh their restaurants look all they want and market their new lemonade drinks to connect with younger guests. But at the end of the day, when their business model is allegedly this exploitative and toxic, I don't think any amount of new paint is going to fix that. But let's just say you still want to eat at Subway after all of this. Maybe you just don't care about the way they treat their franchisees or who their spokesperson may be. Well, just don't order the tuna. One lawsuit claimed that Subway's tuna isn't actually tuna. It's a mixture of various concoctions. Subway insists the tuna in their sandwich is flaked blended tuna with creamy mayo, but the star ingredients are supposedly not even fish. The plaintiff in the suit wouldn't explain what the lab test revealed, so I guess we'll most likely never know for sure what the mystery meat is, but that doesn't really make this any less concerning if we're being honest. Apparently this is done to save money because the fabricated ingredient is less costly, but this has the potential to be dangerous for a whole slew of reasons, let alone any kind of allergic reaction for not disclosing the actual ingredients. But that means that this sandwich doesn't have the health benefits it claims by a long shot, if it's true anyway. Not to mention tuna is one of their most popular sandwiches apparently, so this could affect many people eating in Subway restaurants. Of course, Subway has said that these claims are totally baseless and in court, their argument sort of held up. The lawsuit against their questionable tuna was dismissed because the plaintiffs didn't meet a legal standard to sue. They couldn't claim that they were harmed by the so-called mystery meat or anything, so there weren't enough grounds. Even so, the plaintiffs are determined to go after Subway legally for misrepresentation. The New York Times reported that in a new filing, the complaints weren't centered around if the tuna was actually tuna, but if it was 100% sustainably caught skipjack and yellowfin tuna as Subway claims. Unsurprisingly, when the New York Times put this to the test and actually froze and mailed tuna to the lab, it came back with the result that no amplifiable tuna DNA was present in the sample. So that means it wasn't tuna. However, when Inside Edition sent samples to the lab, they found that the specimen was tuna. So I'm not sure which it is. I don't know if you're actually eating tuna or not. Maybe it depends on the store. The thing is seafood can be mislabeled between 26 to 87% of the time. Fish is often mislabeled as more desirable when it's actually just cod or snapper, which are less desired, but more readily available. And as disappointing as it might be to hear, I really don't think Subway is fully at fault here. Rudy from Catalina Offshore Products explains, quote, they're buying a can of tuna that says tuna. If there's any fraud in this case, it happened at the cannery. Peter Horn, the director of Ending Illegal Fishing Project had a similar statement and added, quote, in the defense of Subway or quite a lot of these fishmongers, the further you get the fish from the bone, the harder it is to recognize what that fish is. Basically, this isn't a Subway issue. And if Subway is having this mystery meat issue, then there are probably plenty of other chains that have it too. Should Subway be more careful with their sourcing? Yes, but so should everybody. This is an industry-wide problem. And while I do think Subway deserves criticism, I think they deserve far more criticism for their chain-specific treatment of franchisees and the whole handling of the Jared Fogel situation, if that makes sense. I feel like that's pretty obvious, but you know, the fish, I guess, too. Now, of course, there are issues with another food too, like the bread. Ireland's Supreme Court said that Subway bread contains too much sugar to even meet their legal definition of bread. And sure, this might just sound like a fun messed up fact about how other countries aren't allowed as much sugar in their bread, but it does feel pretty misleading the more you think about it. I mean, what did Subway advertise when we first heard about them? Eat fresh. 
With Jared as their spokesperson, they promoted healthy eating, insinuating that they would help you lose weight and how good for you their sandwiches were. But with their bread so full of sugar, do they really have a leg to stand on? Again, this is an industry-wide issue. Some brands of Martin's bread have more sugar than some candies, as well as Dave's Raisin the Roof, Wonder Bread, and Brown Bread at the Cheesecake Factory, Udi's Gluten-Free Cinnamon Raisin Bread, and Arnold Whole Grain's Oat Nut Bread, just to name a few. But does this mean that Subway's off the hook? Absolutely not. It only means that they're the only ones guilty of trying to look healthy. When you go to the grocery store and you see a bread labeled oat nut with cute little farmhouse on the package and stuff, you're probably just not expecting that bread to be loaded with sugar. But this is America, so you know, we always find creative ways to put sugar in just about everything, even the most unexpected of things. I'd say the most guilt Subway has in this situation is the fact that they claim to be healthy. Like their whole motto of eat fresh feels incredibly hollow when nutritionists say that they're better than fried foods, but have a ton of processed ingredients and sugar. It's a pretty low bar to hit. Now, at the end of the day, health-wise and finance-wise, you're likely better off buying the ingredients yourself and making a few sandwiches that last for a week. I'm pretty sure most of us already knew that, and that's how most restaurants and chains work. So if you do decide to avoid Subway after this, let it be for the right reasons. Let it be because you oppose the rotten business model that they use because in that regard, Subway is anything but fresh. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. So let me know your thoughts. What do you think about Subway? I feel like a lot of people already knew about kind of the Jared Fogel situations. So that's why I kind of put it in the beginning and kind of got around the, the basics of it, but didn't want to really dig too deep also because it's just really fucking disgusting. But in terms of like, the bread situation and the tuna, tuna gate, whatever. And obviously the way they treat franchisees, that was what I found far more incredible and incredibly terrible if we're being honest. And especially when it comes to the franchisees, they make this low barrier to entry or what appears to be a low barrier of entry only to really screw a whole bunch of people in the process. And they do it and then make money off that situation while the franchisees lose. But let me know your thoughts and If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest information. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.